welcome back to Every Man Academy. My name is Professor JT. Class is now in session. Today we will be discussing the Scarlet Letter, written in 1850 by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I went into this book with a lot of assumptions. Everyone knows the basics, puritanical New England. The Scarlet Letter supposedly means A for adultery, since the main character had a child out of wedlock. I was actually surprised about how much I did not know. For instance, who Nathaniel Hawthorne was, the fact that there are supernatural elements in this book, and that it was written in the 1800s looking back on puritanical times. You get the picture. I didn't pay attention in English class. Let me break down for you the overall meaning as I see it, and give some alternate options for what the A could mean at the end. The way I look at it, this is all symbolic. A carefully embedded theological argument. Now what we need to consider, what each character, location, and of course the titular scarlet letter are meant to represent. Hester Prynne is the major character here. Her story is at the center of this book. She is brought out on the scaffold in puritanical Salem, Massachusetts with the mark of shame on her breast. She has a baby in her arms and has to bear her shame out in the open, be subjected to the questioning of the town's government, Salem at the time being a charter colony of England, a mix of religion and self-government. I started to research the history and then realized this is a fictional version of history, so it doesn't really matter as it pertains to the story. It is heavily implied that she is being shamed for having a child out of wedlock, though it is never outright stated, other than the questioning surrounding the identity of the father. She refuses to answer who this father is, and overall seems pretty angry with the process. She stands there bold and unremorseful as she's questioned by the reverend. Not only does she stand tall, but turns her sin into a mark of pride. She's outwardly showing that she is proud of her sin. I guess the Puritans were nice enough to let her make the letter herself a needlepoint. She goes all out and makes a bedazzled version that really complements its sinister glow. That scarlet letter, so fantastically embroidered and illuminated upon her bosom, it had the effect of a spell taking her out of the ordinary relations with humanity and enclosing her in a sphere by herself. It was so artistically done, and with so much fertility and gorgeous luxuriance of fancy, that it had all the effect of a last and fitting decoration to the apparel which she wore, and which was of a splendor in accordance with the taste of the age, but greatly beyond what was allowed by the sumptuary regulations of the colony. Reverend Dimsdale is the other major player, always holding his hand over his heart. He's the pure one. He really represents the church and Christianity as a whole. He's very forgiving toward Hester. As the story unfolds, we see he is riddled with guilt. Slowly, we see that he may be the father, though he hides his sin rather than wear it boldly for all to see. Roger Chillingsworth is a mysterious, grizzled old man of the forest who shows up in the beginning. It turns out that it's Hester's ex-husband, their little secret, and he wants to know who the father of the child is. He's betrayed and he's on his revenge mission. Roger, in his strange herbs and potions, he has his target set on Dimsdale, offers to help him heal, since he's got some type of guilt sickness that's taking him over body and soul. It seems like he's going to secretly wear him down over time rather than engage in some sort of Jerry Springer-style confrontation. By the way, spoilers are coming, so you have been warned. Pearl is the little girl. She's like a feral child and scares Hester. People around town call her the daughter of Satan and she rejects God. This sinister little girl seems to be naturally growing into a problem child. Hester cares a lot for her daughter and she seems like a good mother but far from winning parent of the year. Pearl evokes a lot of strong emotion in Hester, which she has a hard time putting aside for the betterment of her daughter. Pearl has outbreaks of a fierce temper, which had a kind of value and even comfort for the mother. It appalled her, nevertheless, to discern here again a shadowy reflection of the evil that had existed in herself. Mother and daughter stood together in the same circle of seclusion from human society. Once this freakish, elvish cast came into the child's eyes while Hester was looking at her own image in them, it was as if an evil spirit possessed the child. 
Whether moved only by her ordinary freakishness or because an evil spirit prompted her, she put up her small forefinger and touched the scarlet letter. He did not send me, cried she positively. I have no heavenly father. Now that sounds like blasphemy, whether or not it's nature or nurture. At one point, Hester loses her temper and threatens to throw Pearl into the dark closet. Yeah, mother of the year indeed. Now the reverend and his guilt is wearing him down over time. He freaks out in the middle of the night, tries to connect with Pearl, and embrace Hester. Pearl rejects him. It seems the reverend wants to have it all, embrace them as his own, and hold on to his faith. It's not enough. Long story short, this escalates until Reverend Dimsdale has a big epiphany, gives a speech to the town, is resolved from his torment, and we learn that there was a scarlet letter on his chest hidden all along. Now, the scarlet letter, let's talk about it, represents sin, clearly. It is not outright stated the nature of the sin, though, but the fact that this child Pearl exists, it is heavily implied she's their love child. I would say the letter represents some form of sexual sin. The reason why this is something more than just plain old adultery, it begs the question. Why can't Dimsdale repent and be forgiven? In the Gospel of John, chapter 8, the Pharisees bring Jesus, a woman, taken into adultery, and he says, Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. There we see, adultery is not an unforgivable sin in Christianity, though it is a sin. If you are honest about that, try to move on while, well, according to Christianity, you're saved. What sins can you not come back from? Gospel according to Luke chapter 12 says, Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So my guess is that Hester and Arthur Dimsdale engaged in some mixture of both adultery and blasphemy. There's some strange occult things going on in the background. Rumors of the black man and his book where names are written in blood. You know, the old deal with the devil. An early iteration that we see in movies and TV shows found in the Scarlet Letter. Now there's a woman, Mistress Hibbins. It's a real name. A woman accused of witchcraft in real life before the Salem witch trials. Hester, after meeting with the governor, is thrust into the face of Mistress Hibbins, Governor Bellingham's bitter-tempered sister, and the same who a few years later was executed as a witch. Hist, hist! said she with her ill-omened physiognomy, which seemed to cast a shadow over the cheerful newness of the house. Wilt thou go with us tonight? There will be a merry company in the forest, and I well nigh promised the black man that the comely Hester Prince should make one. Make my excuse to him, so please you, answered Hester with a triumphant smile. I must tarry at home and keep watch over my little pearl. Had they taken her for me, I would willingly have gone with thee into the forest and signed my name in the black man's book too, and with mine own blood. Even thus early had the child saved her from Satan's snare. Let me pull it all together here. Hester has no remorse at all for anything she has done. She wears her sin proudly, and she is a better person. She has embraced sin. She's not afraid of it. Uses anger at times, but also is a helper of others. Dimsdale represents Christian morality and the repression of sin. He's constantly ashamed, does everything he can to work through this, but is destroyed from the inside out. Despite the fact that he could, theologically speaking, ask for forgiveness, he is most worried about being a fraud, living as if he is someone he is not. Denying his sin is denying his nature, and continuing on his narrow path makes him even more messed up. In one scene toward the end, he kind of goes crazy, almost a little bit like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This suggests to me that Hawthorne is saying that if you don't give in to your passions, you may experience a sinister light descent into madness. Before the minister had time to celebrate his victory over this last temptation, he was conscious of another impulse, more ludicrous and almost as horrible. It was, we blush to tell it, it was to stop short in the road and teach some very wicked words to a knot of little Puritan children who were playing there and had just begun to talk, denying himself this little freak. As unworthy of his cloth, he met a drunken seaman, one of the ship's crew from the Spanish main. Since he had so valiantly forborne all other wickedness, poor Mr. Dimsdale longed at least to shake hands with the tarry black guard and recreate himself with a few improper jests, such as dissolute sailors so abound with, and a valley of good, round, solid, satisfactory, and heaven-defying oaths. He runs into Mistress Hibbins, the reputed old witch lady. So, Reverend Sir, you have made a visit into the forest, observed the witch lady. 
Dimsdale admits that he did go into the forest, although he says it was to help a friend of his, Apostle Elliot. <laughs> Cackled the old witch lady, still nodding her high headdress at the minister. You carried off like an old hand, but at midnight and in the forest, we shall have other talk together. Have I then sold myself, thought the minister? This yellow, starched, and velveted old hag is chosen for her prince and master? The wretched minister! He had made a bargain very like it. Tempted by a dream of happiness, he had yielded himself with a deliberate choice to what he knew was deadly sin. And the infectious poison of that sin had been rapidly diffused throughout his moral system. His encounter with the old mistress Hibbins, it did show its sympathy and fellowship with wicked mortals and the world of perverted spirits. The book goes on to reveal that another man had returned out of the forest, a wiser one with a knowledge of hidden mysteries, which the simplicity of the former never could have reached, a bitter kind of knowledge. The minister casts aside his guilt when he gets home and writes himself that wonderful sermon that we see at the book's end. Flinging the already written pages of the election sermon into the fire, he forthwith began another, which he wrote with such an impulsive flow of thought and emotion that he fancied himself inspired and wondered that heaven should see fit to transmit the grand and solemn music of its oracles, though so foul an organ pipe is he. However, leaving that mystery to solve itself or go unsolved forever, he drove his task onward with earnest haste and ecstasy. Satan, the black man, Mistress Hibbins, all represent to me the rejection of Christianity. Well, what specifically do I mean by that? This book was written in the industrial era of the United States. Strict puritanical form of government doesn't exist anymore. Colonial Salem represents society, civilization, the quote-unquote real world. Hawthorne's problem here isn't the Christian theology necessarily. It's the morality that has dictated the way Western civilization had developed for the past thousand of years or so. Let me break it down for you. Certainly much less so in the 1800s, but formation of civilization existed before the law of Yahweh. Pagan religion, polytheism, the Roman Empire would allow for the same gods to remain in various areas after they were conquered. The morality of the pagan world remained largely similar, even if the names of the gods were different. However, in the god of the Abrahamic religions, the Hebrews, the people of Israel, the theology was monotheistic. According to them, their god had it right and rejected all other gods and presented a new morality, pretty different for those times. I believe this book presents an argument for a return to pagan morality, a kind of dualism, a mixture of light and dark. By having society be morally dictated from this Abrahamic moral worldview, it forces certain elements, those who embrace some sin, into the underworld, rejected by the culture at large. Which brings me to the wilderness. It's a place where those who embrace sin are forced to go. It's a mysterious place where the black man, who represents Satan, writes people's names in blood. Where Roger Chillingsworth lives with Hester before the book starts. That's where he cultivates strange herbs. This, to me, symbolizes a kind of polar opposite place. Hester is strained by this oppressive moral structure in Salem. If it wasn't for Pearl, she'd be out in the woods practicing witchcraft all night with old Mistress Hibbins. By making this deal in the woods and symbolically dismantling Christian morality, balance can be achieved by bringing the moral darkness into the light of the brookside. This is the edge of the wilderness where many key conversations happen between Roger, Hester, Hester, and Dimsdale toward the book's end. It's a place of balance, a beautiful place in between the wilderness and puritanical Salem, the line between society and nature, the line in between where Hester comes to terms with both Roger and Arthur, in between the darkness of the wilderness and the repressive structure of society. By the book's end, Hester ends up living in a similar setting and finds her quiet place where she can live her life in peace. Now the revelation, the big stirring speech at the climax, Dimsdale, who represents Christian morality, casts it aside. After an overnight transformation, he is no longer ashamed. He doesn't have to ask for forgiveness and is free to embrace his sin. Proudly show the world he is wearing it. The law we broke, the sin here awfully revealed. Let these alone be in thy thoughts. I fear, I fear. It may be that when we forgot our God, when we violated our reverence each other for the other's soul, it was thenceforth vain to hope that we could meet hereafter in an everlasting and pure reunion by bringing me hither to die this death of triumphant ignominy. 
He goes to give Pearl a kiss and now she can finally accept him that he's cast aside his old faith and embraced a new one. Her spell is broken, she is no longer a feral child. Pearl being a product of whatever deed they did in the woods is now perfect, no longer constrained by the societal structure of Christian morality. Chillingsworth dies too since he's the opposite end of the puzzle. I believe he represents Hester's dark side, the mix of dark and light, good and bad, the morality of Hawthorne. Interestingly enough, the Transcendentalist Club and the associated philosophical movement had a lot of similar man versus nature themes. Hawthorne's wife was the sister to a member, Elizabeth Peabody. So there's a solid connection to support this esoteric underpinning. There's a moment toward the end where Hawthorne romanticizes the good old days of pagan festivals in England, references to the ancients, relishing and sketching for us a different, freer type of living. They were native Englishmen whose fathers had lived in the sunny richness of the Elizabethan epoch, a time when the life of England viewed at one giant mass would appear to have been stately, magnificent, and joyous as the world had ever witnessed. Had they followed their hereditary taste, the New England settlers would have illustrated all events of public importance by bonfires, banquets, pageantries, and processions, nor would it have been impracticable in the observance of majestic ceremonies, a grotesque and brilliant embroidery to the great robe of state which a nation at such festivals put on. No rude shows of a theatrical kind, no minstrel with his harp and legendary ballad, nor gleeman with an ape dancing to his music, no juggler and his tricks of mimic witchcraft, no Merry Andrew to stir up the multitude with jests, perhaps hundreds of years old, but still effective by their appeals to the very broadest sources of mirthful sympathy. All such professors of the several branches of jocularity would have been sternly repressed, not only by the rigid discipline of the law, but by the general sentiment which gave law its vitality. Christian morality. I did it again. Crack the code. With regards to the letter A, I'm going to guess it means anathema or apostasy. Can look up those words. A little homework assignment for y'all. If you're curious about some of the finer points, I can certainly support with more quotes from the book if you want to engage me with a dialogue. I just didn't feel like I needed to waste too much time on all that since it's all there for you to consider once you pick this book up again. Feel free to dig in yourself and tell me what you think. This podcast has been brought to you by the Just Three Murphs Podcasting Network. Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, everymanacademy.com. Got a YouTube channel. Let me know what you think. I'm so glad to be growing this community. It is a great honor to be given just a small little bit of time in your day. As you return to your life, once again, my name is Professor JT. Class dismissed.